success is what whatever you defined it for yourself. Okay, you never look at another artist and go, I want that with, you know, I should have what they have. And there's a lot of people look at me, I should have what Joe has. That's the wrong way to look at it. Are you happy? Are you fulfilled? Hi, this is Joe Bonamassa, and you're watching, listening to On the Record with Ultimate Guitar. All right, man. Well, thank you so much for being here. Um, you got a new record coming out, um, Blues Deluxe Volume 2. What made you decide it's time for Volume 2? Uh, we're creeping up on a couple decades since the first one. Well, it is the, it is the 20th anniversary. Um, the first, first of all, when we did the first one, there was no guarantee there was a Volume 2. There was no Volume 2. It was just Blues Deluxe because that was the last shot we had um, to stay in business. So I wanted to do something that was um, more, you know, I want to do something that was more than just remastering a record for the sake of doing it. And we didn't have any bonus tracks from 20 years ago. So I was like, well, we got to do another volume. So I asked Josh Smith if he wanted to do it. And, and there we go. All right. And uh, how'd you settle on the songs for this one? Are they songs that maybe didn't make the first volume? The first volume was basically the live show with a couple of originals thrown in with basically the last $10,000 that my manager of now 33 years and myself had. Okay. There was no master plan in 2003. It was survival. It was, we are going out of business. There, there is no business. There is no opportunity for anything. There's, there's no, there's, there's no tours. There's no sessions. There's no nothing. Um, we did two albums, one with a major label, one with a, another al uh, label, and and it, and it didn't work out. Radio didn't want to play anything that, that I was involved in. Um, and we were basically nowhere. So um, there was no, like, well, I'm going to keep these for the 20th anniversary. Uh, no, there was none of that thought going on. This this was a truly a new group of songs because uh, I didn't think I was going to do a record like this again. But I just said, you know, we got to do something for the 20th anniversary. It's still like Blues Deluxe still one of the biggest um, selling uh, pieces in our catalog. And it, it's, it, it, it still resonates with people. And I wanted to do something else and just ask myself the question. I'm like, better, worse, you know, push bet, you know, from 20 years ago. So uh, we're gear nerds, of course. Um, it's nice to be talking to a fellow gear nerd. Um, what, uh, what sort of gear are we hearing on that record as far as guitars and, and amps and effects, if any? Well, I'm lucky now in 2023, like when we go, well, I want to sound like the Blues Breakers. Um, let's get the right kit. So when you like songs like Done Got Over It, you, that sounds like the Blues Breaker tone. It's a JTM 45 from 1966 and a 59 Les Paul. Um, everything from three, three, five strats, old strats. Um, there was a Dumble involved. Um, it was an ultraphonics modded Viberlux that I have, um, you know, tweed twin. I think there was a high powered tweed twin cause I blew up the low powered one. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it, it's all, it's it really just season to taste. There's a flying V on the Albert King song, 1967. Um, you know, I mean, it, I, I, have, I have all the right kit. I don't know if you're familiar with me at all, but I'm one of the bigger guitar collectors in the world. So I'm lucky enough to have access to all of this. And I use it. I don't just, you know, stick it behind glass. Right. I've always appreciated that about you and you're 59. Um, can you give us a little background on your, your favorite guitar, that 59 that you use? You know, I got 15 of them. So which one are you asking about in particular? Your favorite one, the one that you, is it the Skinner Burst? Is that your number one? No, we're getting somewhere. Sure. The Skinner Burst, yes. Uh, the Skinner Burst is um, my favorite. It was my second, and I still have the first one, Magellan. Um, and I called it Magellan because I took it around the world. The Skinner Burst, my favorite. It's, it's my, it, that's my desert island guitar. Um, oddly enough, did not use it on, um, did not use it on Blues Deluxe Volume 2. For some reason, I used this thing uh, that I bought in uh, Clearwater, Florida from the original owner. Uh, it was the, the Al Bosco guitar, and uh, it, it just sounded good. And plus, I hadn't been playing it. So I was like, I got to get it out, you know, and, and see if it still works. 
so you know it, it just depends on on the song it just depends on the mood like i'm about to make a record with mike zito and i'm gonna bring some guitars i haven't seen the light of day in years just because i want to get them working again you know and and it's and it's you know it's important that it's important that you do that um you know you just don't want them to sit around because they they do break you know they like like you plug them in they don't work you know that's that's what's well, also the sign that they're old you know and cranky like me <laughs> and uh i always look for you uh for advice on buying vintage guitars so when you're in the market for a vintage guitar what's the first thing you look at what are some some maybe warning signs for people out there looking into buying vintage gear the vintage guitar market is a public pool filled with bull sharks and if you're not careful you'll be consumed lock stock and barrel by said bull sharks here's the thing when you when you decide you want to start a collection take your time like this this whole thing didn't happen overnight it 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 is you you methodically research things and not only do you want to methodically research things you want to handle as many authentic guitars as you possibly can because the books are not absolutions you know because i always say there's a lot of great books out there that have specific information that may or may not align with guitars that were owned by the person who owned who wrote the books so the more that you see and the more time that you take you know it's it's not a flex it's not a it's not a situation where you want to like go well you know i i really need to get all of this in the next year i want to get my 59 i want to get my no, cuz that's when you're going to that's when you're going to find out how many bull sharks there are in the public pool and you can make huge mistakes really quickly by thinking you're getting a deal and it's not a deal it's actually a fake or something with some incredibly something wrong with it and you want to make sure that a first and foremost you like the instrument because it could it could zero out over the next 20 years, it could be worth nothing, it could be worth one US dollar, okay, or a euro or a pound. And if it's worth a pound, then to be honest with you, you still have to love it. Like if the Skinner Burst was worth nothing, like 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 less than a gallon of gasoline or, or, or this 20 ounce Diet Coke, okay, I'd still love the damn thing and I'd still keep it for the rest of my life. It has no value. Okay, I the only time that guitar will have a monetary value put on it is when I'm dead and gone. And at that point, I don't care, you know, because I'm going to keep it forever. And I'm lucky enough to be in, in a position where I could do that. So when you when you when you get into when you get involved in the vintage guitar market, just just be careful. And and you want to buy from trusted sources. And even if you have to pay more, buy from trusted sources, because it's again, you know, there's no Carfax on these damn things. You know, you got, you're in charge of making these, 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 you're in charge of, of going, well, this is, this is right. This is wrong. You know, nobody's going to come out and tell you unless they're like super honest and they do that. But, but some people do and some people don't. It's a tough market to be into. And I would imagine you run into a lot of the bull sharks as you would, as you say, um, it makes me curious, you know, we talk about the mojo of vintage instruments. What is it about those vintage instruments that keeps you coming back and having to deal with these bull sharks to get these, this amazing gear that's such a part of our history? I know the bull sharks. I'm friends <laughs> with the bull sharks. I just don't buy from the bull sharks. Okay? I know everybody. It's a small world. Um, I don't need a guitar. I, I have 550 of them. I, don't, there's, I, I could play one a year for the next half half a millennium okay so i don't need a guitar i enjoy guitar collecting um i enjoy stuff i, I enjoy it's the fine it's the hunt it's finding it finding it under a bed finding it in places you don't you never realize you know filling in some gaps in, in the collection going you know yeah that'll be really cool if we you know find a, a you know triple o martin or something like that you know from the the early forties, you know, it, it, it's, those are the kind of things that you just wait around. You know, I'm not actively pounding the pavement going, I got to get this today. You know, it's like, if it, if it comes along, you know, and I know there's a lot of 
competition now and everybody flexes on Instagram. Look what I found before you. It doesn't matter. You know, um, do, you, do I have enough kit to, to, to for 10 lifetimes? Absolutely. You know, I don't need anything. So I, I, I roll when I can. And, and if I see something rare, I, I have the, I have a, the, I'm blessed and cursed with a good eye. I, I can tell you the rare thing. I can tell you why. And I, and my eyes go right to the, to the mint thing, you know, wh- whatever that is, you know, something that you don't see all the time, you know, cause I, I'm around it all the time. And if you, if you, you know, even in 2023, 20, if you don't see something, you know, especially with the internet and everything else, that's rare, you know, there's rare and rare. You know, like a sunburst strat from the 1960s is not exactly rare. They made tens of thousands of them. You know, they're old, but they're not rare in the, in the, in the sense that, that there's not many to be had. I read somewhere that your first guitar was a 63 strat. Is that correct? I, I, I understand your folks had a music shop, so I'm sure you had kind of your, your pick of the litter when it came to guitars. Uh, why'd you land on the strat? My first guitar was, a, was an Erlewine Chiquita. Oh, that was three quarter scale that Santa Claus bought me, brought me when I was five years old. Uh, my first full scale guitar was a was an import Strat called a JB player. And I liked it because it had my initials on it. Um, my first real vintage guitar was a 54 Strat that I bought when I was uh, 13. And my great grandmother, um, uh, 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 I inherited some money from my great grandmother, some U.S. Treasury bonds that had matured, and uh, my mom and dad were nice enough to let me buy a '54 Strat, which was the grand sum of four thousand dollars at the time, and that was my first real vintage guitar. Shortly thereafter, I got um, a '63 at a guitar show in uh, uh, Philadelphia that that I still have, um, but I always had stuff. Like when I had four guitars, I thought I had like the biggest collection in the world. Like, oh my god, I got four guitars. Insane. But no, the um my very first electric, my very first guitar it was it was an Erlewine um uh Chiquita. They still make them. It's like a little three quarter scale. What were some of the first songs that you tried to learn? Um and I would assume you learned by ear. Did you use tabs? Did you have the, the books? Back in my day, we had cassettes and and vinyl. And uh, first, uh, the very first um, song I learned was uh, Voodoo Child, Slight Return. And, uh, you know, I was about seven when I just was like, kind of got, you know, I had my first communion. So I bought a wah, you know, because Italian kids in upstate New York, when they get their first communion, you clean up, you get like, uh, like I had like a couple hundred bucks and I, I convinced my mother and my, my mom and dad to let me spend it on uh, uh, $65 for a Dunlop crybaby. And uh, I don't have the wah. I don't know what happened to the wah, but, but, but I have a signature wah now. So it goes all the way back to my first communion. So we often think of guitars as tools, but uh, the guitars can also be an inspiration for us and kind of inspire some of the songs that we write. Are there some pieces of gear that you've been finding really inspirational lately? Well, you certain guitars have songs in them. Certain guitars you just don't want to play. Um, certain guitars are so preserved, they're just, like, well, this is crazy. It's like new condition. And then there's some beat up thing that you don't, you don't think is worth a lot or whatever. And next thing you know, you write 10 songs on it. And I'm like, okay, that's, it, it's a binary thing. People, people are, are absolutely drawn to that. You know, certain players just, they have their thing. They have their, you know, Alvarez or, you know, Gibson acoustic that just turns out the tunes. So you've had such a career. Um, how do you define success at this stage in your career? Success is what, whatever you've defined it for yourself. Okay. You never look at another artist and go, I want that with, you know, I should have what they have. And there's a lot of people look at me. I should have what Joe has. That's the wrong way to look at it. Are you happy? Are you fulfilled? You know, is your lights on? You know, these are, these are, you know, before you get to the happy and fulfilled, a lot of, a lot of artists struggle with keeping the lights on and it's a hard business to, to monetize. It's a hard, it's a very hard business to be in, you know, and people's like, well, I think the, the music business in 2023 is impossible. It's, it's not impossible. It's very difficult. 
Winning the lottery is not impossible either, by the way. There are odds, and people do win the lottery. Um, so the reality of getting involved and making music, you have to have this barometer going, if I like it and I'm passionate about it and I believe in it, that's all you need. Um, Cause if you don't believe in yourself, how would you expect to get others to believe in you? And that's a very, that's the only way to look at it these days, you know, and success comes slowly and it doesn't hit you in the back of the head. You, you know, one day you wake up, and you know, like, wow, we're doing pretty good here. And because you just took 9 million steps to get there. It wasn't like you step, you did one step and then you were, you were just launched out of a rocket ship. You know, it happens to some people, but again, people do win the lottery. It's very rare, but there's a lot of sweat. Even, even artists that come out and quote nowhere. If you look at their past, if you deep, deep dive into their past, there's a lot of sweat equity involved. They just, they're not flukes. You know, Chris Stapleton's not a fluke. He's been around and he, and he you know, and an undeniable once in a generation talent that, that comes out and you're like, well, where's he been? Well, he's, he was kicking around Nashville, writing songs, sitting in with Mike Anderson at the Bluebird, singing blues. It's not overnight. And he put the sweat equity in and he stayed in the game. And then the next thing you know, he's, he's Chris Stapleton, one of the greatest of all time. So I had another gear question for you. Uh, what are your thoughts on the uh, amp modelers and stuff? Would you ever consider using those or do you prefer to stick with the, uh, the tried and true two amps? I, at this, at this stage of my life, um, I, I'm not, I'm not actively searching a digital solution to tube problems. Um, does it work for some people? Absolutely. Is, is there merit to it all? Absolutely. Do I think it sounds better? No. Do I think it sounds close enough? Yes. Um, do I think guitar players should own it? Yes. It's like, it's like, you know, you, if you're at, you know, it's like, what, what's your, uh, if I got a fractal. No, no, just own it. Just own it. That's great. I got a, I got a, this, just own it. You know, if it's getting the sound that you want in your head, then there's no right or wrong. Um, I find that the getting the digital tweaked to where it sounds close to an amp is a lot more steps in it than just plugging an amp in and a cable and put, sticking a mic in front of it. You know, um, there's a lot more, you have to be a lot more, you, you have to read the manual, you know, a Tweed Deluxe or a Princeton or a Twin you know, like six knobs, you know, I think the tweet deluxe has got three, you know, it's like, there's not many, many options here. It's like, turn it on, turn it up and go, you know, the twins got seven. It's got presence in mid range and bass and, and treble and two volume. There's not, not, not a lot of, not a lot of uh, options there. And some of them have reverb. Before we go is, uh, is there anything you'd like to say to uh, that kid who just got his first guitar? He's on Ultimate Guitar looking up some tabs to learn his favorite Bonamassa song. And uh, do you have any advice to that kid just starting out? Learn it, but don't learn it to the point where it sounds exactly the same. Always put your own spin on it. You know, I never learned anything note for note. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't see the reason why. I, I and I still don't. You know. I mean, yeah. If I was tasked to play the solo from Hotel California with Don Felder, you bet your ass I'm going to learn it correctly because it's a very specific thing. But if you're just learning licks off of records from your favorite players, okay, learn the gist of it. Maybe learn the whole thing. But then don't just go this, don't play it verbatim. Always try to put a spin on it because all your favorite players that have their own styles generally did the exact same thing but then put their own spin on it. And next thing you know, they have their own style and people are learning from them. So that's a, that's a good, that's a good way to look at it, you know? Mm -hmm. And the other thing about guitar, and I know this is a, a you know, controversial statement is, is, is have fun. It's supposed to be fun. All this arguing and, and, and nitpicking other people and, and competition. Oh, this is my, my favorite. It's like, the, Oh, so-and-so is better than you. You're better. Than, none of it. It's supposed to be fun just play and enjoy and, and, and say to yourself, Hey, listen, 
Um, I am who I am. No, nothing better, nothing worse. Thank you so much for your time and thank you for the new record. It's awesome. I know everyone's going to love it. Thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. 